Okay, well, thank you very much for coming, uh, coming back so, so promptly. Um, I've already partially introduced the next two speakers, and um, both of them uh, are GPs by, by background and, and training, but have become very distinguished authors and broadcasters. And so what, what more can I say? I think that their presentations will speak for themselves, and I think you probably know both of them. So I'm going to call first Paul and Margaret. It's great pleasure to uh, invite Margaret McCarthy, GP from Glasgow, to come and talk to us about advocating for evidence. Margaret, thank you very much. So thank, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. So um, advocating for evidence, what a great subject for a talk. So first of all, my declarations of interest, which I hope you're getting from everyone that's speaking to you in whatever talks you ever go to. I'm a GP partner. That means I earn quaff points, the mark of the devil. I'm an undergraduate tutor at the University of Glasgow. I do freelance writing and broadcasting. I've never worked for a PR company um, or anything like that. And I've also made a social investment in Who Made Your Pants, which is a fantastic social enterprise. I do encourage you to look on their website. They train um, refugee and asylum-seeking women um, how to make pants in Cardiff. And I think they're great. Sorry for the advert. So, evidence. Um, evidence runs through me really like a stick of rock. I am, I, I am absolutely passionate about using high quality evidence to make sure I'm doing the right thing by my patients and I'm not harming them. And I do think we have to demand evidence, but also think really critically about what that evidence is and why it is that we're using it. If we don't use evidence, we all know what happens. People go to the Berinsky Clinic thinking that they're going to be cured from brain tumours. People use homeopathy. The homeopathic hospital is less than a kilometre from my house. I know it's been videoed, but I do spit at it every time I go past. <laughs> And why do we need evidence? Well, if we don't use evidence, we waste. We waste our resources. We waste people's time. We waste money. We waste opportunity to do better by our patients. We also create the illusion of hope. We get people to hope for things that we can't genuinely offer when our hopes should perhaps be directed towards things that we can offer, whether that is, in fact, a good death rather than the, the futile aim of prolonging life by non-evidence-based interventions. And time really is, I think, the, the resource that we have to think most carefully about. Every time something new comes in, I do think we have to ask ourselves, what is the opportunity cost? What have we to stop doing in order to do this new thing instead? We have to ask that because the NHS is now getting to a critical stage with what we can and can't offer. So time, time is a really big issue, not just, of course, for doctors, but for patients. We shouldn't be wasting patients' time by telling them to do or take or be things that is not going to help. And I think we've been kind of presented with the idea, I think, through being a GP, is that somehow all evidence is equal. And if there's evidence, then evidence is evidence. And we must bow down to its mastery. But of course, you all know, because you're all here for Cochrane, that all evidence is not equal. Evidence is, in fact, very unequal. Some evidence is extraordinarily bad. And I think when we don't use our critical faculties to examine evidence, we end up with um, a brutal portrayal of oppression, propaganda, and tyranny. And I'm going to show you how. So we know what we don't know sometimes, other times we don't. It is very much here be dragons. There's a lot of stuff out there we do not have a clue about, some of which we recognise, most of which we probably don't. But loads of research didn't ask a useful question to start off with. Just an example, there was a trial and with lots of publicity saying that mindfulness was as good as CBT for no tablets, medication SSRIs for depression a couple of days ago, but there was no third arm, there was no usual care arm. So really, what are we testing here? We already know the evidence is a bit dead dodgy for SSRIs and long-term care. So really, that wasn't that useful for my patients because I don't really know um, what to do better. Um, lots of research just replicates stuff that's already been done. Um, I mean, why are we still doing trials in homeopathy? You know, it's just such a waste. Loads of trials are underpowered, just poorly designed, just should never have got the go-ahead to start off in the first place. Loads of trials are not clinical meaningful with great um, information about what matters to patients in terms of laryngectomy trials. If we're not doing something of use to patients, we shouldn't be doing it at all in terms of clinical research. And Cochrane can really, really help with that. Cochrane can really start to interrogate the evidence and bring forward good questions and get better answers for patients. But of course, we're still in lots of dilemmas. This is the wonderful Hilda Bastian. Does it work, says the patient. Well, the statistician says, that depends on what you mean by does it and work. <laughs> 
And I think this is this something that we really have to hone down on. Just because we get a p-value that looks as though it might be marginally significant, what does that actually mean in the real world? It might be statistically significant, but it may well not be clinically significant. And we have to, I think, be much more critical of the kind of evidence summaries, I think, that we keep getting from on high. And just to remind you about the real-life world of general practice, this is what I'm battling with. So 10 minutes per patient, well, I come in early and I leave late, so about 12 minutes, and my blood pressure going up by about five millimetres every half hour I'm running late. Um, and these pop-up boxes all the time, and this is the way that GPs in the UK work, we are contracted to the quality and outcomes framework. Points mean prizes, but actually points, you have to earn the money in order to pay your staff, pay your rent, you're kind of locked into this thing. And there's lots and lots of boxes. So a patient comes in to talk about their depression, to talk about the fact that their brother hung themselves two weeks ago, and I am paid to ask you whether or not you're still smoking. It's not just ludicrous, it's not compassionate, it's not helpful, and it's not right. And I think um, we have not been strong enough to say we, we need to get rid of this nonsense and actually focus on the patient and the patient's needs, not what the government would like to say, that we've improved general practice because more doctors are asking more people about smoking. So the, the way that evidence comes through to me as a GP is, is really through um, guidelines. And we've got the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, as you know, and the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network. They're the people who are paid to synthesise evidence, and we know that Cochrane is part of that synthesis that often goes on, and then present it to GPs. And GPs, like myself, then have to enact that evidence. And I'm going to show you how this does result in, in my opinion, oppression, propaganda and tyranny. So I see my patient as the round hole, an individual person who has individual needs, expectations, combination of symptoms, family circumstances, other stuff going in in their life. And all too often, I think the evidence is just hammered in like a square peg. You must fit this no matter what. And we don't have enough leeway and to say, actually, this is not an appropriate thing for you. This is not the right thing for you. Let's look at this holistically. We've kind of lost that. So just to take a recent example, this was NICE's press release um, a few months ago. Um, wider use of statins could cut deaths from heart disease. This was the press release. Up to 8,000 lives could be saved every three years by offering statins to anyone with a 10% risk of developing cardiovascular disease within a decade, says NICE. And this was a change. The previous um, estimate risk was 20%. And what NICE went on to say was that up to 4.5 new people could be eligible for statins under this new lower threshold. Offering statins to all eligible people could help to prevent up to 28,000 heart attacks and 16,000 strokes every year. And these absolute numbers look quite big until you work out that's a number needed to treat of about 102. So 101 people have to take that statin for three years in order to prevent one event from happening. And in my experience, when you put this stuff to patients, it doesn't always go in the way that NICE would, would assume that perhaps it does. And, and this is what NICE says about guidelines, which, remember, is the way in which real-life evidence is enacted within the general practice community, and we see people in the front line. And what they, what they say in their kind of summary document about how to use NICE is, this guidance represents the view of NICE, arrived at after careful consideration of the evidence available. Healthcare professionals are expected to take it fully into account. I must take it fully into account. When they recommend interventions, the guideline development group are confident that given the information that is looked at, most patients would choose the intervention as an assumption of values, as an assumption that NICE's values are the same as your values, my values, my patients' values. The UK population is ageing and atherosclerosis is an age-associated process. Few trials assessing cardiovascular outcomes have recruited many people older than 80 years. Just remember that line. So patient-centred care, this was from a nice poster up at a conference recently. Evidence is at the heart of everything we do. Okay, patient-centred care. What they're telling us now is that patients and healthcare professionals have rights and responsibilities. All NICE guidance is written to reflect these and within the NHS constitution. Treatment and care should be taken into account individual needs and preferences. So they are acknowledging that we must help patients make informed decisions about things that they're offered. But evidence is at the heart of everything we do and there's no trials for people over 80. Well, not very many. Okay. So this is a summary of the new guidance that came out from the, the NICE guidelines, um, basically saying that in 10 minutes, um, remember, People older than 40 should have their estimates of CVD risk reviewed on an ongoing basis. How often? When? Who knows? No evidence for what? Where, where does that come from? Where's the reference? We said it before. You know, there's loads of trials now that the Inter-99 trial. There's loads of trials of the health, health check study in London published last week saying that you know, the impact was marginal, if any at all. 
offer people information about their absolute risk of cardiovascular disease and the absolute benefits and harms of an intervention over 10 years, as in statins. And they're saying that we should prevent individualised risk and benefit scenarios, present the absolute risk of events, use appropriate diagrams and text, encourage the person to participate, find out what people's ideas are, what their expectations are, and consider people aged 85 or older to be at increased risk of CBD because of age alone and offer them a statin. We just said there wasn't enough trials. So there's a huge gap between my patients in terms of what evidence I can give them if they're aged over 80. Nicer saying we should offer you a statin, but we don't have the trial. So why is that not an only in research recommendation? I don't know. But in the same 10 minutes, Nicer also saying that I should do all this other stuff, assess their readiness to make changes about lifestyle, assess the confidence in making changes to the lifestyle, inform them of pot future potential management based on current evidence, involve them in developing a shared decision plan. This is all very good, very good, but in 10 minutes. You know, I think I would struggle to do that in half an hour realistically. And I think when we don't use evidence realistically in the real world, we get it wrong, we do it badly, we don't do it properly. And we have to start talking about this. We have to start talking about the resource of time and how we spend our time, which is the biggest and best resource that we have at all. So a few months after NICE published their guidelines to say that we should no longer use a 20% risk, we should now use a 10% risk, NICE developed some patient decision aids, which were um, really to try and help people make up a decision about whether or not they wanted to take a statin in the long term. And there's various diagrams, various bits of paper. It's quite a long document that you could use um, to print out, except that in the actual, um, in the actual appendices, for the NICE guidelines themselves, it said that expert opinion suggests there is insufficient capacity within existing primary care resources to meet the increase in demand of a result of implementing the guideline. In other words, we're putting this guideline into general practice, but we don't have the resources for it. And it's just to remind you that resources are like a pile of cakes. If all the adults eat the Tunnock's tea cakes, there is none left for the children. Okay. This is incidentally what the ambassador's party would have looked like had we voted yes. <laughs> And just to remind you, this is um, the, the conflicts of interest that were listed in the NICE guidelines about statins when the risk was dropped to 20% to 10%. There were so many, I couldn't fit them on one slide. People who receive personal payments from Merkshire and Dome, people who are on advisory boards, people who give lectures to the lipid nurses at AstraZeneca, people who were sponsored to go to NICE cities, to go to conferences. Is this really the kind of evidence we want to enact in our population? We really need a trial of two groups of people trying to reach consensus about difficult stuff, one group of which has no financial interest and the other of which has the normal, and see what differences there are between them. That's the kind of trial I would like to see. So just to remind you, evidence in real general practice, um, that's Annie's Land Cross in Glasgow. I live and work within about 400 metres of Annie's Land um, Cross one way or the other. And I can tell you all about my practice. I can tell you where the resource centres are for mental health problems. The canal, the, the thing down the middle is the, the canal, the Sustran cycling path. And one of the great joys I have is cycling down there in the evening time with my kids and bumping into my patients who are working their dog, walking their dogs and things. It's great to live and work in the same place. But it does highlight the issues that real people have. Um, and I think that sometimes evidence is co concocted in a kind of Lulu land. And actually, when we put it into the real world, there's lots and lots of unanticipated problems that we hadn't foreseen. Even with the very best tools, we get our risk calculators for cardiovascular risk really, really wrong. So the grey box is everyone. The pink box is QRIS, your risk calculator for people who are meant to be at high risk of cardiovascular disease. They're the pink boxes. The blue box is a nice Framingham high risk group okay, that are identified within that population as having a high risk of cardiovascular events in the next 10 years. But the yellow box is the people who actually do develop cardiovascular disease. Now, if you had a good risk calculator, the red box, the, sorry, the yellow box would overlie either your blue box or your pink box. It doesn't. So my medical students and I were thinking about doing a dartboard comparator to see if we're better with a dartboard blinded to pick out the people who really were going to get cardiovascular disease compared with our risk calculators, because I don't think they're very good. And I think we present risk calculators as something that is definitive, something that's really helpful, something that will really hone risk. They're pretty rubbish, and I think we have to start talking about that. This is the difference between what patients will accept in terms of outcomes for taking long-term interventions like statins compared with what they actually do. So the top graph is what people said they would, how long people would take tablets for, sorry, 
The top graph is people saying, um, how, were they willing or not to take tablets in the event of how many life years they would gain? So there was quite a lot of people, almost 40% of people said that they would take tablets for any gain at all. And then there was a bit bar down at the very end said that people would only take statin tablets in the long term if they gained more than 120 months of life. So there's quite a wide range of what people said would be an acceptable benefit for the hassle of taking tablets. And the bottom graph shows what actually you do get with statins. So you get some short term outcomes, but not very many longer term ones. So there's a mismatch. If we gave people what they wanted, those two graphs would be the same, but they're actually extremely different. Do we tell people this? I don't think we do. And just to put this into a bigger frame as well, about 50% of people do not take their medications as prescribed, and we know this. We also know that people who do take their medications as prescribed were more likely to live longer, whether or not they had an active drug or a placebo. In other words, people who already take tablets regularly are more likely to live longer. So if you put your prevention strategy into trying to prevent health inequalities into getting people to take tablets for longer, you're more likely to give longer life to the people who were already going to live longer anyway which doesn't sound to me like a very good deal. And I think it's a very, very risky strategy. So on my normal day at work, in my 10 minute consultation, when I'm probably running late and there's probably, um, someone has probably fallen at home and who's going to help pick them up and should I get an ambulance, all the other hassle. Someone comes in to see me and this is kind of not quite real life, but based on a kind of real life scenario. A 60 year old lady who's got rheumatoid arthritis and she comes in to ask me, should she go and self -asalazine? There's a letter from secondary care. Can you please discuss it with your doctor? I'm a generalist specialist clinic. Fairly typical scenario. We don't know what you want to do. Here's, here's, a, here's a letter. Go and take it to your doctor and try and decide whether or not to go into sulfasalazine. So my job as my patient's advocate is to advocate also for evidence. What do I do? I go into Google. Help. This is a graph showing apparently um, your likelihood of benefit and harm with various disease modifying drugs from rheumatoid arthritis. I am very, I'm having difficulty interpreting this. I don't really know what it means. Everything's everywhere. And what, what does it mean for my patient? Don't have a clue. It's very complicated. So help, help. What do I do next? I go into the shared decision making website. Great. I find a fantastic shared decision making tool for rheumatoid arthritis. First class. I say to my patient, this is what we need. We need to go and do this together. This is going to take quite a long time to do. I ask her, could you please please do it at home, although well, she has no internet access. And actually, it's actually more than that. We started asking our patients, we think probably about 25% of our patients don't have internet access at home, which is actually a, quite a large proportion of our population. This particular lady can't see very well either. So if I give her printed out sheets, it's actually going to be quite difficult for her to read them all. And we have to remember as well that a proportion of our population are functionally illiterate, very difficult to read normal text and make sense of it. And I think we sometimes assume that everybody's as good as us. It, it's not the case. But the other real problem that comes apparent within a few minutes of talking about this is that my patient would like my opinion on what she's to do because she's terrified. She's really, really scared. She already can't see very well. She feels quite infirm with her joints being so inflamed and sore. She's terrified about losing her own independence. She has caring duties herself. What will she do? What is the best treatment that will help her maintain as much independence as possible? So that's quite a massive amount of stuff to try and unpack in 10 minutes. And I can certainly get so far but because of the normal problems of health inequalities that we have to deal with, we're dealing with literacy problems, internet access, understanding problems. It's so much more than just a shared decision aid. And of course, this is not just a 10 minute patient with one consultation. We deal with between three and four problems per consultation. She also wants a repeat prescription for her hypertensive medication, her statin, and do I really need them, doctor? Can we talk about that too? And quinine from leg cramps, there's meant to be no evidence for that, but she thinks it's quite helpful. Also, can you have a look at this mole? And I haven't heard back from the physiotherapist. That, that's completely typical, that's completely typical. This is why I have wrinkles. And this is how I feel. I'm not really one for cat photographs. In fact, one of the few Twitter accounts that I've blocked is the emergency kittens feed. But this is very much... Um, they just send you really pictures of cats all the time. So th this, is, um, so th this is really how I feel. I feel tangled up in lots and lots of tools and stuff to try and help me. But actually, my patient's sitting there sort of saying, actually, I'm really scared about losing my independence. And I, just to highlight, I think that we are practising medicine just now in a climate of fear. I think doctors, when you ask them, they're scared. There is research um, literature around this what do doctors feel about their job. And I think when you go into medical school, you have quite an idealistic, kind of hopeful vision that you're going to do something useful and do something good for people. And it kind of gets beaten out of you, you know? And then it's very much the kind of um, Hunt-esque kind of idea that, you know, if doctors are missing cancer, well, the best way to do that is to publish that online and say something must be done. And I think we're all feeling a bit afraid. 
And that means it's quite difficult to share risks because what if it's a melanoma? I don't think it is. Should I send her just to be sure? What if I stop her statin and she has a heart attack or a stroke? Is that my fault? Will I be blamed for doing that? It becomes quite difficult, I think, in a climate of fear to practice evidence-based medicine with shared decisions because we're all a bit frightened, we're all a bit afraid. So here's another gentleman, a 62-year-old man, who's had recurrent depression over the years and has had fleeting suicidal thoughts. He's divorced, he's a heavy drinker, he's not dependent on alcohol, he tells me. He's isolated and he's new, newly unemployed. And from a, from a GP point of view, that's lots and lots of high-risk stuff in there. That's someone that I should feel quite <coughs> concerned about. But on the contract, as far as the contract is concerned, he's known to have um, chronic kidney disease stage 3, which is a kind of made-up diagnosis, but anyway. Um, and, and so because of that, he's got to have lots of other stuff done. He's got to have his blood pressure done, he's got to have his bloods monitored, um, and he's late for them. He, ha he doesn't come very often to us. And it's probably a sign that he's feeling so bad that he's come to us now. So as far as the contract's concerned, I've got boxes popping up. But what do I do for this gentleman? Well, I'm concerned about his risk of suicide. Um, we know there's good evidence for cognitive behavioural therapy in someone like him. And what about medication, he says? Should I maybe go into some tablets for him? So I know that medication SSRIs are ineffective for mild and moderate depression. I know that with them there's an increased risk of suicide. Um, and I know that they've been overhyped and overused. So I'm a bit sceptical about using them. And I try and give him information about that. And I say to him, OK, there's a shared decision-making tool for for um, options that you have just now. How about looking at that? It's a great website called Living Life to the Full. It's like an online cognitive therapy tool. What about doing that? How about coming back to see me next week and we can see how you're feeling? How about cutting back down on the drink? Maybe that would make you feel a bit better. What about food? What about sleep? What about exercise? That all sounds quite jolly and sounds quite nice, but I've really failed quite massively if that's all I do for this gentleman. So we know that telling people to do exercise when they're depressed has a small to very little no effect. We know that 80% of people who are addicted to alcohol are also depressed and there is evidence that abstinence can reduce some depression symptoms but there are lots of studies that are saying that really if that happens then a lot of the time that the alcohol intake is actually representative of an underlying mood disorder. So actually the evidence is making me feel quite confused and quite muddled about what really I can do for him. And in terms of cognitive therapy, well locally, once you've jumped through the several hoops that you have to keep saying, yes please, I would still like cognitive therapy, for, for which a depressed person is a huge thing to have to do. The original trials about MCBT were 21 hour sessions on a weekly basis. Locally, we offer six after about three months by a, a mental health practitioner, not by a psychologist. Is that really what the evidence ordered? I don't think so. There's some evidence for guided self-help, but that's for um, nurse input into that as well, so I'm not sure about that. And in terms of the contract, I failed because I didn't tell him to stop smoking, I didn't do his blood pressure, I didn't arrange blood tests. But in my defence, I would say that good care is not just about the evidence, it's also about what's happening on the ground and what I'm doing. And the bigger problem, I think, with the evidence that we're now working to in general practice is that of less and less, or the evidence that we have as enacted by guidelines is less and less relevant to the patient group that I'm dealing with. So this is a really um, great study that was done recently, um, a review of clinical practice guidelines, finding that actually for the NICE guidelines that they examined, 22 of them, there were 495 recommendations for primary care based on research from 1,573 patients um, publications, but only 38% of them were based on patients typically found in the general practice community. So we're losing lots and lots of research on patients in primary care that were not done on patients in primary care. And that means we have to put up a bit of a red flag and say really how relevant are they? Because this is the reality, this is what we're dealing with, this is multimorbidity, I'm sure you've all seen this graph. As we get older, we gather more chronic diseases. So when you get to the age of, what, 69 or so, 60% of people have got at least two, if not three, disorders, chronic disorders. So that's things like depression, COPD, angina, asthma, accumulating lots and lots of disorders. This is the new normal. This is, the, this is what we're dealing with day to day in general practice. And the problem then becomes um, we're following lots of lots of different guidelines for the same patients. We might be following a CKD guideline for kidney disease, as well as an angina guideline, as well as, say, a diabetes guideline. And this is a study just published in the last couple of weeks in the BMJ, basically looking at drug disease and drug-drug interactions. Following um, recommendations for prescription in 12 national clinical guidelines would result in several potentially serious drug interactions. So the more guidelines you're on for the more chronic diseases you have, the more drugs you're prescribed and the more interactions they are. Who's studying this? Where are our studies of multimorbid people where we're following three or four different guidelines for them? How do we know we're not harming people? I don't think we do.
um, Trish Greenhorst and, and colleagues, I had a tiny part in this, wrote a really great paper, um, obviously I'm biased, um, last year in the BMJ, just looking at where evidence-based medicine has got us just now. Are we in crisis or not? I actually don't think we are in crisis, but I think we're really in need of pulling back and putting the direction back firmly in favour of patients because so many vested interests have got involved. We're not looking at holistic care of patients. We're looking at special interest groups and our patients are not like that. Yes, some people only have one disorder or one disease, but where are the pressure groups? Where are the, um, the patient groups that are campaigning for multimorbidity, you know? Because um, and, that is the reality. And unless we study this properly and put pressure to study this properly, we, will, we will do not know if we're doing harm or not. Just have a look at the way the evidence is used to judge GP surgeries. This was the Care Quality Commission who decided that one in six GP surgeries were failing. And, and many GPs were so dispirited by this. Morale plummeted, and I do think morale is really important in, in healthcare. And what was the evidence for this? Well, actually, um, the CQC publicly identified St. Thomas's Medical Group in Exeter as amongst the highest risk practices. The practice manager said the practice was advocated a band two for factors such as 10 patients out of 1,000 not having their BP in the range at the time. And one patient not being offered smoking cessation advice. <laughs> And this is the end result of evidence distilled by guideline used to judge how doctors are doing. I don't think this is acceptable. One GP that I'm very fond of wrote, my CQC inspection was the most unpleasant exercise of my career so far. He had to justify what boxes had been ticked in the computer in relation to what he was doing with patients. Now, I have many patients whose blood pressure doesn't reach target because I sit and say to them, look, what do you want to do? Do you want to increase your medication with all those side effects you just told me you want to avoid? Or do you want to just sit where we are? And actually, I think you're all right, because I think the last Cochrane review about hypertension said we're over-treating it. Is that okay with you? And that's normal, good general practice. And instead, it's used as a whip to beat doctors with. And it's patients that lose out. And I don't think that patients' voices are being held in, heard enough when we talk about what matters to them in primary care. I don't even know what a good GP is. I think in, a, in a, any given day, I can be both good and awful in the same day. Is it doctors that adhere to guidelines? I don't think so. Is it CQC ratings? I don't think so. Is it the friends and family test? How do we know that that's a fair representation of everyone that goes through a system? I don't know. This is the idea that people just rate you if they're either very pleased or very pissed off. People don't seem to rate people that are doctors that are just doing okay. Feedback questionnaires, every year I ask 50 consecutive-ish patients on different days or of the week um, what they thought. And everybody seems to think that I'm fantastic, um, which is which is um, because um, I think I'm giving them the, this... Um, well, it's actually really interesting. I used to give a feedback questionnaire. It was just a normal feedback questionnaire. It was, it, was, it was fine. But ever since I did the official GMC one that says GMC at the top, suddenly I'm just amazing. Dr. McCarthy's and I think it was because people think, I must defend her against the GMC. <laughs> So there's all kinds of weird things going on. But my, my bottom line feedback question here is, is I'm not sure whether I would find out if I was crap or not. I think that people who are really upset with something terrible that I'd done <laughs> might not want to complain. So I'm, I'm not sure how, how we know who's good or not. Is it mortality rates? Well, I have to say, ever since we took over, ever since there was two nursing homes built in our patch, our mortality rates have gone up. <laughs> Am I being really rubbish as a GP? And then there's systemic problems, and um, there's problems that are landed down to us when really bad evidence is used. This was um, uh, kind of one of these flash screen things at Euston Station last year. NHS England set this up. Know someone under six, over 60 feeling under the weather, a minor illness can get worse quickly, or it could get completely better by itself. <laughs> And I think this actually led to harms because I had loads of people that went to the pharmacy to get something to make their minor illness better quickly and then came to see me 12 hours later saying, but I'm not better yet. <laughs> So the harms of this kind of stuff was just kind of went, and I think we really have an issue with the way that evidence is misused in public health campaigns. I don't think it's done well enough at all. And then we have this stuff, so my children still don't manage to get photographs well when the car is moving. <laughs> so, and I lean them out the window. <laughs> Say, take it now, take it now, take it now. Oh shit, we've missed it again. So this took about 20 journeys by in this particularly <laughs> annoying poster. And what really upset me about this was um, that I had patients who were upset about this because they were dealing with difficult symptoms in relation to their cancer and they did not feel positive. They did not feel full of hope. They did not feel ready to fight. And we know that there's good evidence that your, your style of dealing with cancer or other chronic illnesses <coughs> makes no difference at all. And I think that the subliminal message about this is that if you don't fight your cancer, you're kind of weak and you deserve to die. And that is so harmful. And I know Cancer Research UK did a similar kind of thing as well. And there were so many patients saying, this upsets me so much. 
and nobody listens. So I think we have to really hope, you know, people that are out there with, with non-evidence-based messages, messages that are capable of doing harm, we have to protest against that um, because otherwise it's just going to continue. And then we have the drug companies, of course. What will you do when influenza breaks through? <laughs> don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but this was Tamiflu, and you know the fantastic work that Carl Hennigan's been doing, the BMG have been doing about kind of all the problems around Tamiflu and um, non-publication of research <laughs> trials. But this was a brochure we got through, really sort of saying, you know, you know, get ready to prescribe it any minute now, and not, of course, um, disclosing any of the huge issues around um, the fact that we didn't have any all the data about it yet. And then we've got the newspaper stands, um, what doctors don't tell you. <laughs> they don't tell you it because it was a load of rubbish. Um, <laughs> and um, every week, I think um, the, the Nightingale Collaboration, who are a great organisation who campaign about bad adverts in the press, I think they managed to get the most ever adverts um, complained about upheld with the Advertising Standards Authority in any one given magazine. There was something like 42 adverts in that magazine that were dissed by the ASA because they were so appalling. But it's not just um, what Doctors Don't Tell You magazine, it's not just blatant um, magazines like this that don't give us good evidence. It's also like, shrink your shape, burn fat in four minutes. I mean, there's just this whole um, lay literature out there that just seems to say whatever it wants and it just goes unchallenged, I think, most of the time. And there's a great campaign by Sense About Science, Ask for Evidence, I'm sure you've heard of it. Great, uh, great hashtag, loads of great work on that, which is fantastic. I would encourage you to join in with that because it's a really great structure to actually ask more organisations for better evidence about things. But um, unfortunately, we can't compel people to stop doing things if there's no evidence in it. Unless, of course, it's a critical mass, particularly of patients, who um, start saying this is really not what we want. And just to bear in mind, as I'm advocating for evidence, supposedly as a GP, and we talk about individual patient needs and care, there's a really big, bigger picture here, and that is that poor people die younger. I think we're kind of in danger of forgetting this. We've got this massive problem with health inequalities in Glasgow. If you stay in a poor area, you're more likely to die younger. That's, there's high quality evidence for, for that, and in London and, and across the UK. That's the really big evidence issue for me. That, that's something that I find um, appalling, that we're still having to deal with these huge gaps in life expectancy, depending on what postcode you're born into. And these are the big issues, I think, that we need to start talking about in terms of evidence. We know quite a lot about smoking. We know quite a lot about public effects of smoking. We've got plain packs legislation at last now. What about alcohol, minimum pricing? We know that there's really good evidence for that, as good as it can get. Um, but why have we not enacted that yet? Why, why has that not made a difference? And we know that those two things will make a big impact in health inequalities. And I think sometimes we can get so um, you know, worried about decision needs or whether the benefit from statin is one in a thousand or one in two thousand, whatever it is. But these are the really big things that we have to talk about mental health, parity of access to mental health. Um, you know, why does someone with a depressive illness have to wait for 12 to 16 weeks to start cognitive therapy? If you had cancer, you would start treatment sooner. Many mental illnesses have a worse mortality rate than cancer does. Why are we still in the dark ages with that? Financial inequalities, minimum wage. Why, why do many of our medical institutions actually, and we've done lots of work in FOI that will be coming out soon, um, why do so many medical charities, medical institutions, not pay the minimum wage to their workers, including several royal colleges? Um, employment, you know, we have to start talking about employment as a public health issue. That is something that we have to really start talking about more in terms of health rather than just politics. Food inequalities, food banks, great piece of work in the BMJ last week, great bit awful, showing the rise of food banks in the UK. I, there have been weeks that I have um, referred more people to food banks than I have to acute medical care. You know, that, that has an impact on health. You know, that, that's something we really need to talk about. Housing, you know, and many of the housing stock that people are living in is just appalling. Some private lets should, I mean, mould growing in the roof. How can people thrive and be happy when they're living in housing that's just so appallingly poor? Our benefit system, you know, with the ATOS stuff going through now, they've now ditched the contract. We've got Maximus coming in for us. So much of my time is spent trying to help people navigate through a very cruel system that does not appreciate that sick people just sometimes can't work. And what I'm really concerned about is who's advocating for all that evidence? The fact that people, poor people are dying younger. Where are we going to go with this stuff? This is really compelling stuff. And I, and I worry that sometimes we get so, um, so involved in individual level evidence, we don't talk about the real public health things that matters. Instead, we've been put down this kind of rabbit hole of talking about health checks and screening, when actually this is real public health. These are the real issues we should be talking about. And just to bear that in mind, I think, um, when you are advocating for evidence, we need to keep looking at the bigger picture. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Maurit. <coughs> very thought-provoking, as I, as I knew it would be. <coughs> Excuse me. And we'll have some questions later on, um, if we may. Um, we, I was going to say we have another GP, but Phil may be about to tell us that he is no longer a GP, although I imagine, Phil, that once a GP, always a GP. Is that... Uh, yeah, I is it, struck off. It hasn't been struck No, no, no. <laughs> Let me make that clear. For the avoidance of doubt... <laughs> no, no, no. So, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Phil Hammond. Thank you, and thank you, Margaret. Isn't she wonderful? Yeah. I could live inside Margaret's brain. It'd be an amazing place to live. I just absolutely have filled my brain up. One of my wise old teachers said, never miss an opportunity to teach, never miss an opportunity to learn. Uh, and I just always inspired when I hear Margaret speak. Uh, you're going to step down an intellectual level now, I fear. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to explain something. It does need a bit of evidence. It has a bit of an evidence basis to it, but it's my big theory of everything. It's not quite on the level of Stephen Hawkins, but I'm going to explain to you why clangers uh, is a good way of getting evidence into practice. Uh, I was giving a talk the other day, uh, and I was asked what I'd learned in my 53 years, 30 years since I first set foot on an NHS ward, uh, and I thought of my dad. My dad was an academic chemist. He was a brilliant scientist. He got a scholarship um, to do a PhD at Cambridge. He was Australian. He captained all Australian universities' basketball team, uh, but suffered from depression. was quite a, 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 sometimes very funny, but sometimes a bit low in his mood. And I once, as a kid, made the mistake of asking him what the meaning and purpose of life was. So it was a dangerous thing to ask a scientist. And dad said, there is no great purpose. There is no grand design. We're all slowly returning to room temperature. <laughs> which I think is the second law of thermodynamics from what I can remember. It's fairly true, not terribly optimistic. Um, we can take the long view, we can take the short view. You could say from a geological point of view, our lives are over in the blink of a geological nanosecond. So what are we doing? What are we doing with our lives? Are we making this amazing evidence but sticking it up on a dusty library shelf and not actually making a difference to people's lives? So when I was asked what I think the point of purpose of life is, I tried to be more optimistic. And I think, I think we exist on this planet to love and be loved. Would you say that was fair? What is the evidence basis for love? Does Cochrane have a love? <laughs> I think it should do, because inequality in love is probably a huge issue. So I just want to start today. I want you to turn to the person next to you, give them a hug, and say, I love you. <laughs> I love you. I don't care. With, I love you, Margaret. Always have. I love you. Just do it. Come on, don't be shy. Let's have some hugging there, some serious hugging. I love you. Excellent. Good. OK, you can stop now. You can stop now. <laughs> Lovely. Sel Self-love is also very important, but uh, <laughs> please wait until you get back to your hotel for that. Um, <laughs> love is really important. Why do I think love is important? I always think, when I hear Margaret speak, compassion is what should unite the left and right in politics. It's what should unite the secular and the religious. Compassion is everything. When you're looking for what you want in a doctor, what you want in a politician, what you want in a researcher, it's a combination of compassion and competence. And competence, as we know, is a hard thing to judge. The evidence is hard to judge. But compassion is the one thing that, that should unite us. That's what the NHS was founded on. So uh, I'll just throw that thought out with you first. Uh, because I knew Margaret was doing this, I had to do this sort of declaration of interest thing. That <laughs> I don't normally do PowerPoint, but I thought, Cochrane, I'd better have a go. Um, so here's mine. Can you trust me? Uh, I've received money from the NHS since 1987, the BBC. <laughs> Private Eye, nice. I've chaired the NICE conference for about eight, nine years now. Large number of newspapers, magazines as a columnist. Many companies, including drug companies, uh, mainly for comedy and conferencing. I've done comedy, golly, since 1990. I first went to the Edinburgh Fringe in a double act called Struck Off and Die um, <laughs> with another junior doctor called Tony Gardner. And we were angry junior doctors fighting against our appalling working conditions, working 120 hours a week. But more often, um, the big issue was you were... As a junior doctor then, there were colleagues of mine doing major surgery for the first time unsupervised with their consultant not even in the hospital. See one, do one, teach one. Have a go first before you ask for help. You know, that sort of culture. <laughs> and I tried to change it through the BMA, and I would rather sit at home and nail my testicles to the table than, than, than sit through the BMA. I don't know if anyone's here from the BMA. I appreciate this is being filmed. <laughs> so we decided to do comedy instead, and we, uh, we went to the Edinburgh Fringe and got picked up not in the BBC, but... The thing about trusting comedians is comedy and politics, well, in comedy, you're allowed to lie for laughs. That's what the, the basis is. A lot of comedian stories have a kernel of truth. There's a little maybe mini pearl there. And you polish it and polish it and polish it. And you lie for laughs. You make it as fun as you can by stretching the truth. And it's very liberating. 
But I think what's interesting about comedy, it has a very hard out point. You're here to make people laugh. It's quite a simple uh, uh, outcome to measure. Uh, and if you don't make people laugh, you don't get bums on seats, etc. So you can sort of judge how you are as a comedian. As a doctor, you, I could be pretty appalling as a doctor and still have a waiting room full of patients. So ironically, I feel more accountable as a comedian than I do as a doctor, but I'm not necessarily sure you should trust me today because I may just lie for the hell of it because uh, that's what comedians do. Margaret, I would say, is, comes across as terribly trustworthy. I may occasionally exaggerate something because I think it's funny and it may be complete nonsense, and I just want you to know that. Um, you're not so happy with that, are you? Okay, I'll tell the truth. <laughs> First trick of public speaking is know your audience. There was a few hisses in the audience. I, okay, I'm going to do as much as I can to tell the truth today as... as, as much as my slightly peculiar wired comedy brain allows me to. Okay, can you trust anyone? Uh, just about every one of these organizations from the NHS upwards has fallen foul of vested interests, willful blindness, neglect, incompetence, negligence, uh, as have I, I'm sure. However, most, I think, on the whole, are forces for good. Even the pharmaceutical industry, I would say, overall, is a force for good, but it has pockets of appalling care uh, and cover-up, as you know. Um, but we're all, at the moment, trying to struggle with the pressure for transparency and accountability uh, and uncertainty in a culture of fear, blame, and also fake certainty. I can't, uh, when I hear what the politicians are saying, particularly about the, uh, uh, the UK election, I know here in Ireland you won't be much interested in that, but they're making ridiculous claims about the NHS we know are nonsense, like everyone over 75 will be able to see a GP on the same day. Well, no, they won't, and do they really need to anyway? I mean, these are sort of really important things. Everyone in Labour will have a midwife by their side 24 hours a day. We will have a 24-7, seven-day NHS. No, we won't. We know it's complete nonsense on current levels of funding. We won't be able to do that. There's a 30 billion gap in the NHS that Simon Stevens optimistically thinks we can, we can claw back. Oh, that's nice. 22 billion with new models of care. Well, I don't know. We started off with uh, clinical commissioning consortia, didn't we? Um, Pathfinder consortia. We now have vanguard locality commissioning. Where's the evidence base for health policy? I think that's really important. But we know that there's this big gap. But I would say in defense of the NHS, when it was founded, half of us died before the age of 65. Uh, now, one in three of us live to the age of 100. And as we had to live in Glasgow, one in four people still die before the age of 65. So there's still these huge inequalities. And to build on what Margaret said, I think the thing that shocks me more than the difference in life expectancy between rich and poor is the difference in years of healthy living. 20 years difference in healthy living between the most healthy and the least healthy people in our society really is quite staggering. Uh, okay, so can we really trust anyone? The other thing about human beings, I think, is we have evolved this remarkable capacity to lie. We're fantastic liars. We lie to other people all the better um, to lie to ourselves. And I don't think you can ever truly see inside somebody's mind or heart. Uh, if we looked inside our minds and you could actually have a machine to do that, there'd be all sorts of peculiar fantasies which would scare the hell out of our close friends and family. So when we talk about the truth and trust and all the rest of it, I think it's complex. And as Ben Goldack, he's got that lovely T-shirt that says, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, trust and truth are sort of a strange bedfellow sometimes. OK, love and be loved. Uh, these, now I don't know if this is evidence-based, but I've got somebody coming on my radio program who's come up with the three stages of self-love. When you're a kid and your parents have set too high expectations, you think, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough. You work in the NHS, you think, God, I've had enough. And the final step in self-love is, I am enough. Sounds great, doesn't it? Does it have an evidence base? I don't know. Margaret will maybe tell me, but I, I hope I find out before he comes on my radio show. But I think that's a really important thing is self-esteem and confidence uh, and courage, uh, uh, not just amongst um, NHS workers and researchers, but also amongst patients is fundamental. The evidence is no use unless people have the confidence and the courage to use it. So we can call it health literacy. We can call it what we want. What we need to do is educate people so they feel confident in asking awkward questions, asking about the evidence, understanding uncertainty, advocating for themselves. And that's a real issue. I think probably we would have greater gains in health if we invested in education as much as the NHS. OK, evidence in context. Who said that? Who wants to guess? Despite our financial and economic anxieties, we're still able to do the most civilised thing in the world, put the welfare of the sick in front of every other consideration. Yeah, obviously, Bevan, just about anything Bevan said was amazing. And one of the reasons I guess we had the NHS, he was just a fantastic orator. Uh, and that's one of the things. And that's the context. So when you think about evidence in the NHS, for example, that's the context in which we work in. We aim to try and treat according to clinical need, irrespective of um, ability to pay. And as Margaret said, I don't think we're getting there at the moment. I think we sort of missed the boat a bit. Uh, a friend of mine recently went for the post of medical director. The corporatization of healthcare, I think, is an interesting thing. Uh, he wants to care for the, medicals, the, the people with mental illness, but he was told that the core purpose of his role to drive the business development strategy in line with the business proposition, scanning the mental health environment for new opportunities 
and identifying and stimulating new business solutions that fit with the corporate vision. He decided he didn't want that job. So we're trying to encourage people to go into management, but the corporatization, I call it almost the McKinseyization of healthcare, is very much corporate these days, whether it's a contract between a CCG or a foundation trust or whether it's outsourcing health care services to the private sector. The language has changed. It is profit-driven. You could give examples of, of companies that make profits and also deliver very good services, but generally, uh, when you have to make a 5% profit for shareholders in the long term, if you can't do that, you withdraw your services, and we found a big issue with that in the NHS. So where's the evidence for outsourcing the NHS, which is happening on a large scale? Whether you call it privatization or not, there's a moot argument about whether something is publicly funded could be privatized, etc. but actually we're outsourcing it. I want to know the evidence for health policy as much as anything else. This is my favorite advert for no particular reason other than it shows the nonsense uh, that people talk about. Applications are invited to become a blue sky practitioner reporting to the blue sky lead in the new NHS modernization agency. The work streams will work to a generic cycle based on a hypothesis driven creative problem solving process to create improvement products. You will undertake horizon scanning and futures research, creating curve leverage systems for rapid diffusion, helping customers articulate and understand mess. <laughs> I was about 28 grand a year based in Leicester, from what I remember. But the issue, one of the ways I think is, one of the ways the culture of medicine has shifted is that when I went to medical school, I was told in my first two years I'd learn more new words than a student of Russian. I don't think that's strictly true, but the point was you would learn all these schoolboy Latin and Greek terms to bamboozle your patients with menorrhagia and dysuria and polyuria and polydipsia. Um, and the culture has changed now, I think probably because of the internet and open access medical dictionaries and, and uh, medical soaps. Patients are becoming a little more literate and they can look up these terms. Often they get them wrong, but they can look up them. I know a lot of doctors who don't understand the management speak at the top of the NHS. I went to a, a quite an interesting um, debate with um, Lord Warner, as he was then. He was a Labour peer talking about new independent sector treatment centres that had popped up in the NHS with lots of orthopaedic surgeons who desperately wanted to be able to use these nice new MRSA-free buildings to treat their own patients. Uh, but for some reason, they couldn't. We were bringing in foreign surgeons overseas to do hip operations, and there seemed to be less accountability and follow-up. And these surgeons didn't understand why. So they said, Lord Warner, why can't we use your new independent sector treatment centres? And he said, you can't use them because of additionality and contestability. <laughs> and these orthopaedic surgeons didn't understand what he was talking about. Well, too proud to say, I don't understand what additionality and contestability are. So they just let it go. There is a new language at the top of the NHS that I don't understand. I suspect it's a Trojan horse for privatisation and new models of care, etc. But uh, I think that's really interesting that people who are supposed to be the guardians of power and the most intellectual people in the NHS don't understand and engage with the management of it. There's still a big disconnect between the centre and the front line. Uh, and I think it's because we throw our arms up in the air and say, well, we're sort of struggling with the evidence base for clinical practice, but the evidence base for NHS reform is such a nonsense, I'm just not going to get engaged with that. And I think that's a pity. I think as you get older as a doctor, uh, somebody described as, as walking into the NHS every day of your life and you get these little showers of spittle on your shoulders that are like cynicism. And you get this big crust of cynicism once you get to the age of about 40 that's quite hard to break through. Your idealism goes and you stare at the computer and you worry about your pension fund and your next skiing holiday. But you lost that youthful idealism, that stand up and shout and advocate for patients and advocate for evidence you had when you were younger. And that really worries me. The, the, the fear at the bottom that Margaret alluded to worries me, but also the cynicism and the disconnect at the top worries me. And I don't think we're going to get that collaboration um, we need within the NHS uh, unless we do something about that. Okay, that was just, uh, Andrew Lansley uh, <laughs> is a bit of a tit, uh, to be honest. And I, I know we're filming this, but let's be honest. He <laughs> I went on, the reason, I'll just show you this, because this will make Margaret laugh, if I've still got it, oh no, I haven't got it, I haven't got the wallet on me, but basically I've got one of these NHS prescription cards, which means that I'm on a minimum of uh, two tablets a day for life uh, at the moment. If I, uh, just a quick guess, diagnose Dr. Phil, who thinks I'm mentally ill, put your hand up. <laughs> Who thinks I'm physically ill? <laughs> Who thinks physical and mental illnesses are inextricably linked? <laughs> Who thinks I've uh, got risk factors? <coughs> Who thinks I've been overdiagnosed? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I did uh, question time with Andrew Lansley. It's the only time I've done it, only time I've been asked to do it. Um, and this was really interesting. Uh, I, I was there to debate the health and social care bill as it was then in its first reading and I thought well this will be like have I got news for you without the laughs but I'll be okay I can deal with an audience this will be fine uh, so and I couldn't get at that time I couldn't get the health and social care bill online so I went down to the the shop opposite the house of commons and bought it 354 pages I couldn't understand a word of it 
I, anyway, I don't know how intellectual you are. I bet you, however bright you are, you could not make head and a tail of the health and social care bill. It was just written in this ridiculous language I just couldn't understand, as if someone wanted to do a really complex operation on you, but you couldn't understand the consent form. And Lansley was going, don't worry, it'll simplify things, hand over power to GPs, absolutely fine. Your GP knows you better than anyone, give them all the power. Uh, but I couldn't understand it. So I then got the electronic version, the PDF, and I searched for words that I thought were critical to compassionate health care, such as compassion. How many times do you think that word appears in the health and social care bill? Empathy, transparency, accountability, trust, about 700 times. Sadly, all a concept, uh, or a building rather than a concept. Um, <laughs> But there are 88 mentions of the word competition and not one mention in the first ish, uh, edition of the word collaboration. Uh, I think there was one cooperation and no integrations. And they changed it slightly as people started to cotton on to this was all about making the NHS more competitive. But it's actually made it ridiculously complex. So I don't understand the structure of the NHS. When David Cameron at the moment says we've reduced bureaucracy in the NHS, I would say that was a complete nonsense. They've cut the number of managers in the NHS, but the bureaucracy with all these new commissioning bodies, you know, if you try to outsource a, um, uh, a particular service to the community from a hospital, you've got to get the local area team interacting with the CCGs who have to get NHS England on board and maybe Public Health England. Uh, and it's just unbelievably complex. I now have lawyers blowing the whistle to private eyes saying we're earning so much money out of NHS reforms, it's embarrassing and it's not making the service better. And we complain about man money going to management consultancies and lawyers, but it's because people don't understand how these all complex new bodies all interact. They're incredibly legally complex and it's created a huge mess. And again, doctors are actively disengaging. Most CCGs aren't actually run by GPs at all. They're run by people who are formerly working in PCTs, coming in and trying to make sense of the nonsense. So, uh, such a huge, huge own goal. And you could say, oh, is it, has it been set up to fail? Will it mean that the private sector will come in and pick over the remains? I don't know. It depends on your conspiracy theories. But it's clearly a nonsense and a huge error in healthcare, uh, and without any evidence base, and actually without any mandate, because they said there'd be no uh, major reorganization. Uh, and just the final thing, who said that quote up the top? Which health secretary? Pub quiz? I'll do an impersonation. A penny wasted in the NHS is a penny stolen from a patient. <laughs> Doesn't really help, does it? <laughs> Patricia Hewitt, I think, said that <laughs> as they were launching that one. You remember that wonderful Connecting for Health? What was it called originally? The big NHS computer system that cost billions, and we were all promised our old handheld uh, computer records. It'd be like a little credit card we could walk around and access our notes. We're still being promised our electronic records, and some get ahead practices are doing that, but it's certainly not universal. And what do we think these are? What happens in the Northeast that cost 812 million and will be paying back 5,512 million? PFIs. PFI. So these are the PFI build costs and the PFI final repayment costs. Staggeringly bad value. Uh, and when politicians say they, they love the NHS, I think they mean they'd love it off the balance sheet. That's what they're saying. So they sort of outsource this stuff. And PFI was one big disaster that the Tories started Labour, picked up and ran with. And it's cost a huge amount of money. That's money that should be being spent on patients. Uh, and that absolutely does my head in, because all these hospitals now have a huge, it's like a, running a pub and you get charged, you know, a thousand pound rent before you can open the doors a week. And, and they're really struggling to, to operate at the moment because they're absolutely stuffed with debt. OK, so we need a B-Day revolution in healthcare from the bottom up. <laughs> Took me a long time searching to get a clanger on the B-Day. <laughs> I can't really tell you the other photos I came across as I was searching for that. <laughs> but there we have it. A B-Day revolution from the bottom up is what I'm advocating. Uh, and obviously, to get evidence into living and into the NHS, you need strategy and tactics. Uh, and strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Uh, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. You need them both. So uh, here we go. My strategy for life in the NHS is collaborate. Um, there's a wonderful woman called Margaret Heffernan who wrote the definitive book on whistleblowing uh, called Willful Blindness. And she's written a second book about collaboration. It really got me into the idea of collaboration. It's full of wonderful stories that says collaboration is not about all agreeing on stuff. Collaboration, you have respectful disagreement. And the beauty of research, of course, is that often you have your research hypothesis and you hire someone, often a statistician, to try to prove you wrong. So collaboration is about mutual respect working in a team, but it can be people trying to prove one hypothesis completely wrong, working against each other within the context of support. It's a really interesting concept. But I generally think life is better when we're reformed, included, involved, and uh, allowed to be innovative. Um, I think we've become a bit risk-averse and fearful of innovating. So that's my theory, is that collaboration is the way we're going to save the NHS. I think probably we need collaboration at the top. We probably need uh, politicians to grow up and collaborate around evidence and compassion. 
you know, quality, safety, proper evidence and compassion should unite everyone. We shouldn't need to have manufactured party political rivalries. Uh, but also you need collaboration at the bottom. How are we going to inform and involve patients of different levels of literacy uh, in managing their care? Uh, so clangers. Connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. Now, clangers is my theory of everything. Uh, it's the theory of having a good holiday. Connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. It'll improve your sex life. Connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. It's also very useful when you're ill. Uh, the reason I came up with Clang is the Clang bit actually came from the Foresight Project. That was a government-funded project that looked at the ways of well-being, I think they call it. How can people with not much money uh, live uh, and improve their mental health, I think was what they were asked to do. And the connection thing is fairly obvious. We are social animals. Everybody says, Margaret will tell me if this is nonsense, that loneliness is as bad for you as 15 cigarettes a day. Probably is. Social isolation of people living on their own is probably the biggest crisis facing us. So connection is really, really important. Uh, you know, you can't make sense of evidence unless you have people to help interpret it uh, in a clinical context. Uh, but people connect with pets. Who's got pets? Pot plants, place, peonies, all sorts of things you can connect with. But that sense of connection, I think, is absolutely vital. The learning stuff, and the reason you're here is you get out of bed because you're curious about stuff. Learning is absolutely vital. Uh, within context. And there's good evidence that people who somehow remain mentally healthy keep their curiosity alive. They get out of bed because they want to learn about stuff. Uh, the active stuff, being mentally and physically active at the same time, uh, walking outdoors, I much prefer to joining a gym. Is anyone here a member of a gym? Yeah. I hate gyms. I, I joined a gym when I moved down to Bath. It was a lovely old Georgian building. And even with my new very focals on, I struggle to see the Sky Sports and the MTV unless I'm on the front row. So I go on the front row, and I've only been there about 15 minutes, and the owner of the gym came up to me and said, look, I'm terribly sorry, Dr. Hammond, but you are ginger. Uh, you're in quite tight lycra. Um, <laughs> you're sweating profusely. You're not terribly nice to look at. Um, do you mind if we move you back a row? <laughs> Every time I went in there, they moved me back a row. So I was right at the back of the gym. I couldn't see a thing. And I thought, no, no never mind this. I'm going to use my gym money. I'm going to get out of the gym somehow, and I'm going to buy myself a couple of dogs. How many people here have dogs? See, I have a theory. If we could prescribe dogs on the NHS, there is an evidence base, uh, as well as drugs, we would save it overnight. And the evidence base is great. If you hug a dog, it reduces your blood pressure. <laughs> it also reduces your cholesterol by eating your food. A dog will look at you. Your husband doesn't look at you. Your GP doesn't look at you. A dog looks at you. It tilts its head slightly. It focuses on the most asymmetric side of your face. And it keeps looking at you until you take it out for a walk, OK? <laughs> Not stuck in some sweaty gym. You've got the blue sky, the green fields, all that mindfulness stuff, beautiful surroundings. Every other dog owner you meet is a friend. Automatically, you've got a social circle. You never really know them. It's sort of Bofus's mum or Mitzi's dad. And... <laughs> Dogs keep you supple as you bend over to pick up the poo. And if you're too depressed to put your pants on in the morning, they'll lick your testicles. <laughs> you don't get that at the doctors, do you? Well, if you do, you probably ought to tell someone. Okay. So that's sort of vaguely. I do think there is an evidence base for dogs. And, uh, and if you can't have one, there's lots of so They take dogs into hospital and stuff, don't they? So connect, learn, be active, notice. The notice stuff, I think, is interesting, isn't it? Because observation is what we do as researchers and clinicians. Observation is everything. Mindfulness, apparently, uh, means observation, noticing stuff without having to judge it. So you observe, and you go, isn't this lovely and beautiful, and I'm going to listen to my breathing, and isn't this fantastic? Uh, and I think there probably is something in that. I think there is a re some evidence base for mindfulness. Uh, <laughs> certainly as good as SSRIs for depression, apparently. Um, but I, there's a theory that the brain can only hold so much information. So if you manage to fill it up with sensations of the moment, then perhaps it can push pain and anxiety and depression uh, out the way a little bit. Uh, uh, but noticing stuff when you have to, noticing because you're about to give somebody the wrong tablet or something is patient safety. So there's noticing when you have to act and noticing when you can just enjoy being in the moment. Uh, the eating well, I think, is fundamental. I would agree with Margaret that, that probably we need to do more to stop the, the really bad food getting in there. I think the evidence based on eating and drinking I find quite confusing. Um, the Japanese eat less fat than us and have fewer heart attacks. The French eat more fat than us, fewer heart attacks. The Japanese drink less red wine than us and have fewer heart attacks. The French drink more red wine than us and have fewer heart attacks. In fact, you can eat and drink what you like. It's speaking English that kills you. <laughs> Has no evidence basis whatsoever. That's what comedians do. They make up silly gags, a silly, silly gag, cross it out. It was completely silly. We could go the other extreme, actually. I would say instead of decriminalizing drugs, I would criminalize really bad food. 
a trans fatty gristle burger should be like a class A drug. If you're caught with one of those, you're locked up for five years. A Victoria sponge would be like a class C. You're allowed a small slice for yourself, but you mustn't push it onto other people. <laughs> a lot of it is portion size, isn't it? Is it true that we've got it badly wrong on animal fat and we should really have been demonizing sugar and processed foods more? Is that true? I don't know. I get, to, I get in terrible trouble when I... We used, we used to do the standard animal fat, saturated fat's not terribly good, and now everybody says it's all about sugar and processed food. I think it's what my grand... My granny used to say moderation in all things. I think it's moderation and, of course, portion size. I remember my, one of my GI consultants used to turn the plate over and try and eat on the underside of the plate. Obviously, the food goes everywhere, so... <laughs> but that's a portion size. A portion size is that, not that. Uh, and that makes a huge difference to people's lives. Then the relaxing bit, I think, is important. My Uncle Ron who I'll tell you about in a minute, but my Uncle Ron, Australian Uncle Ron, he used to have a sitting room that was just for sitting. Isn't that great? There were no screens. At the end of the day, flop, come in the sitting room, and you'd sit in the sitting room. There was nothing in it. So you were forced to reflect on the day. Uh, and, of course, the big theory behind mindfulness and action for happiness is that the, the, uh, the brain is still very plastic. It's neuroplastic. So if you focus on the end of the day that the good things that have happened in your day, be you're grateful for the love and family and friendship and dogs that you have around you, it doubles the benefit of it. What you focus on is what grows is the theory there. But he was a very happy man, and he would relax every day with no screens. One of the theories with chronic fatigue, um, I, I work with young children with chronic fatigue now up to the age of 19, and one theory that it might be becoming more common is that so much education is so screen-based now, so kids stare at screens all the time at school, and then they get home and stare at screens for eight hours. Uh, and it does odd things to your brain uh, and your education. There was a really depressing study in America that found American school kids could identify 100 corporate logos, but not five wildflowers. So nobody goes outdoors anymore. Nobody understands the joy of stepping outside. Uh, so I think the relaxing thing is really, really interesting. And then obviously sleep. Uh, you can't cheat on your sleep. The brain's really active then. You know there's a good evidence base of getting the right amount of sleep. For chronic fatigue, they don't get better unless you get their sleep right. So often they will get complete day-night reversal where they're up all night on a screen, which if you're on an iPad, you might as well shine a torch in your face, the amount of blue light that comes off there. And often they get complete day-night reversal. Unless you anchor their sleep, you get them up at the same time every day, including weekends. And they don't oversleep. You know, they don't sleep for more than about nine hours. Uh, they don't get better. But if you do get their sleep right, uh, you make fundamental progress with them. So sleep's really important. Connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. What I noticed when I was, I was asked to write a book uh, recently called How to Get the Best from the NHS. And I was asked by Quirkus, who were the big drag, drag and tattoo people. And I thought, I don't really want to write a manual that enables middle class people to jump the queue. And they said, well, here's a 15,000 pound advance. And I thought, I really do want to write this book. I've always, <laughs> I've always been fascinated in that. Uh, I've never been a patient. I am a patient, as in I'm on blood pressure pills. I've never been overnight in a hospital. I've obviously observed as a doctor over 30 years. But I thought, I don't want to write what's in my head. I'd rather do what the NHS should do and listen to patients. So I connected loads of stories from patients with different degrees of literacy, not a random sample. I collected them through my Twitter feed. I've got about 32,000 followers. I've got no idea who they are. Uh, I go around, I do the NICE conference, I do patient safety congresses, I do comedy gigs. Anywhere I could go, basically, I collected stories, but a completely non-random sample. Asking people, what do they do to thrive and survive in the NHS? What can they do for themselves to improve their NHS care? And it's really interesting. Some people just look slightly blank at you as if, you know, um, what would you do, doctor, is all I do. But there's some really interesting stuff, uh, I think. Uh, and actually, when I distilled it down, I found most of them were clanging. They made an effort to connect with the team treating them, know their names if they could, what they do. And it, they could do it on a simple level. They could connect on an intellectual level, or they could always bring the receptionist in a nice piece of fish on a Friday. I mean, they connected as a group, learning that actually healthcare is all about compassion and collaboration and relationships. They figure that out. They got really frustrated when they go for pillar and post, seeing different people, having to explain stories to different people. They valued human relationships and compassion of knowing someone beyond anything else. The ones who could learned as much as they could about their condition. They've sort of got it now that you're going to live to 100 and 80 of those years, you're going to have a chronic condition. Uh, you might as well learn how to manage it as best you can. So once you've got over the shock, anger, numbness, denial of your diagnosis, actually learning as much as you can. And there are some really good training programs for diabetes, et cetera. And once you've learned about your condition, being as active as you possibly can in your management. There's a lovely story about a kid called Josh, um, who's a working class kid who had really brittle diabetes and used to have an emergency admission with ketoacidosis once a week. Uh, and his nurse suggested Flow, that very simple text message system uh, that people use to text people, to remind them to measure their blood sugars and to give them other sort of health promotion stuff. 
uh, and he's used that. And the reason it's worked is he really likes his nurse. He's got a really close collaborative relationship with his nurse who he gets on really well with. And he always has his mobile phone on him. And she texts him this message. He knows it's coming from the nurse. He says, well, here's my nurse in the pocket. He's gone down from pretty much one uncontrolled ketoacidosis a week to one or two admissions a year just by having a nurse text him messages. I mean, it's that simple. So there are some stories in the book from people of different degrees of health literacy, but generally they're connecting, they're learning, they're active, they're noticing stuff. Uh, they have the confidence to speak up when they don't think things are right. And there's a whole range of people who are recording their consultations on their iPhones. They're taking notes as they go in there. They're leaving notes and instructions for the doctor to do. And you think, golly, could this ever happen? Well, it's happening at the moment. Now mobile phones are in hospitals. There are people who see their mother lying in a pool of something who will take a photo of it, hashtag the chief executive, and, and tweet it. And you can say this is a good or a bad thing. We need to evidence this and see what's going on. But it is happening. You can't reverse the tide of social media and ratings things because they're out there anyway. Um, so connect, let them know. And the give back is a thing I thought was fascinating. When I first walked onto the wards at St. Thomas's, um, we often didn't, about half the patients, we wouldn't tell if they had cancer. They had a little bit of a problem down below, a bit of a warty growth. It'll get a little worse before it gets a little better. You're batting on a bit of a sticky wicket. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> Rarely we would tell people if they had multiple sclerosis, because we can't do much about that, they don't really want to know, wouldn't generally tell people if they had dementia. And I remember those early days of HIV where we would dress up in space suits and, and get these terrified, frightened people on the, the doors of St. Thomas's at the front desk and, and not really know what to do with them, and we were really scared and frightened. But actually, that was the lesson in patient empowerment for me, because I worked in sexual health for a while, and the patients with HIV were the most empowered, informed patients. They would read whatever came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, they would understand it, they wanted to fit in with their lifestyle, they wanted a holiday from their tablets while they were doing this and this. The most active, assertive patients, brilliant researchers, and fair go to the drug companies, you know, they stumped up the money to fund the drugs, etc. If you think of HIV when I trained and swathes of young uh, gay people dying versus now, I mean, it's not quite the new high blood pressure, but if you live in a country, you're lucky enough to live in a country that manages it properly, uh, it, it's a chronic disease with perhaps a normal life expectancy. Isn't that extraordinary turnaround in such a short space of time? And I think actually patients accessing the evidence and advocating for themselves was a, a big part of that. So that's sort of my role model for patients doing this. And I think what really has changed is the internet. So of all the patients that I interviewed, many would say, as soon as I got Crohn's disease, didn't have a clue what that is. I fall in the river, oh my God, I'm drowning, I've got Crohn's disease. They'd either go to a charity or through a charity they'd find a chat room. If they got into a good chat room full of reliable people, their knowledge levels went up almost woo, really quickly. So A, I've got Crohn's disease too. B, this is what you need to do, et cetera, et cetera. So there are wonderful websites out there like Health Talk, which have wonderful stories about what it's like when you're first diagnosed with cancer and how you tell the kids and what it feels like to have an NHS wig. But actually, ultimately, a live chat room with people all sharing the same thing is really different. And people want to do that. You can go to the pa people like me, or patients like me websites to chat rooms in just about any charity. Charity plus chat room plus good specialist nurse for a condition were the three things that people said are amazingly helpful to keep your GP close to you at all times. And you start building these pillars of collaboration, but you also share your experiences and give back to other people. So there's quite good evidence that people are happy when they're giving back to others. So connect, learn, be active, notice, give back is a good model when you're ill. Obviously, you wouldn't choose to have diabetes. It's a good model to choose a holiday with, but it's, I think that sort of works. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. You're welcome to evaluate it. The eat well, relax, and sleep, I think, are fundamental too. Okay, so quickly, one of the things we use in chronic fatigue is I get 90-minute consultations. Can you believe that? I used to have 10 minutes as a GP. I get 90 minutes, and we work with psychologists, and one of the things they try is something called ACT, accept, uh, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which, you're, if you're religious, is just the serenity prayer, apparently. You accept the things you can't change, and you commit to change the things you can, and then you take action. That's quite an interesting model I found of looking at illness, but also often not taking action. So the one thing I got from Margaret, when I read Margaret's book, the first thing I did was give up general practice. Uh, <laughs> and the second thing was to ask every patient or encourage every patient to ask, what would happen if we just watched and waited? What would happen if we did nothing for now? And in 90% of the cases, to be honest, you'd live as long as you would if you took the tablets, probably. I mean, isn't that interesting? It's a really killer question. What would happen if we did nothing? What's most likely to happen if we did nothing? It's a great question. Uh, but also remember, failure is how we learn. The other thing I like about the Clangers model is that dropping Clangers is making mistakes. Uh, and we're very bad at admitting and learning from those in healthcare because we're frightened of being sued. I, I heard somebody talk about the, um, the uh, probes landing on Mars recently. 
And this bloke says, amazing, you landed a probe on Mars. And the chap said, yeah, it took us 20 years. We failed every year for 20 years. And every year we failed, we learned a bit, and we incrementally improved step on step. And finally, we land the probe on Mars. It happens in medicine too, but we've got really frightened of admitting error. We now have to have a, a legislated duty of candor. And it, that fear comes from the top down. The fear comes from a politicized system where people are worried to admit the honest reality of the NHS with an election coming up, so bad stuff gets hidden under the carpet. And you always have a public inquiry. As soon as the new party gets into office, they say, let's have a public inquiry to diss the last party. But public inquiries aren't the answer. What the answer is is to harness the power of patients and carers and frontline staff as a smoke alarm to nip problems in the bud. For them to be able to do that, they have to have the confidence and courage to speak up, and we need a management structure to listen to them. Uh, most of my work for Private Eye over 23 years has been listening to and advocating for NHS whistleblowers. It started with Steve Bolson, the Bristol whistleblower, uh, and is still going on now. James Titcom at Morecambe Bay would be one of the latest I helped. Uh, what's interesting about the NHS staff is I've never been sued for getting a story wrong in 23 years, but I've never once been able to get an NHS whistleblower back their job. So the whistleblower nearly always, for doing the right thing, raising concerns about poor or substandard care, is the one who ends up leaving employment, often leaving the NHS altogether. In Steve's case, he had to go and live in Australia. So there's something badly wrong with the culture of the NHS. If, if, if as a scientist, you can't admit error, I mean, error, admitting error is how you learn. How can you operate in that culture? And as Margaret says, if it's a culture of fear, it's very hard to have on, honest, open transparency. OK, 90% of symptoms a dog is more used than a doctor. True or false? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I've got two dogs. That's a golden one and a white one. That's, uh, that's one for each testicle. Uh, no, I didn't mean that. But they give me more joy than anything else. That's what I do every day is walk the dogs. That's my clang. It's a whole clangor in walking the dogs. And I think this idea of moving upstream, remembering, we call it social prescribing or some nonsense so you can evaluate it properly. But yes, reading groups, book groups, love, companionship, support, all those sort of things I think have been slightly overlooked. The power of community. I'm a patron of a wonderful charity called Kissing It Better, set up by two former nurses, where they use the power of the community to go into hospitals and care homes. And they take in manicurists and hairdressers in training who need some practice. They go in the hospital and they, they do the hair and the nails of the, uh, the patients who are in hospital. Um, they're now thinking of taking people in care homes out to further education colleges so they can have uh, their nails and hair done there. And the carers can then do a course side by side at the further education college while they're doing that. And there's lots of innovative ways of using the community to improve health care, because that's where I think the biggest gains and the solutions probably lie. Uh, Margaret said 10 minutes is never enough. I was thinking what we have to do in 10 minutes as doctors. You've got to listen to the symptoms, connect with the story. You've got to connect with the person. You've got to assess the symptoms. You've got to acknowledge the suffering and what they've been through. You have to agree some sort of plan of action. You've got to negotiate around their needs. You have to summarize in safety net. You can't do that in 10 minutes. That's an absolute nonsense. Uh, and look at this. I don't know why I put that photo of me up. That was in the middle of the Sunday Times in 1990 something on the headline, Doctors in Distress. Uh, but I was talking to a midwife the other day who said, I just would love to have the time to do the job I trained for. We're just about to get mums and babies out of the, the ward safely, uh, but we can't do the breastfeeding, the bonding, all the stuff we'd love to do. It's really dangerous and haphazard. Uh, and I know Ed Miliband wants to give everyone their own midwife right through, but where we're going to suddenly magic up 3,000 midwives, I don't know. But I, I now have 90 minutes, and it's fundamentally the change the, the way I practice medicine, and particularly the people with multiple comorbidities on multiple tablets. You can't do it in 10 minutes, and I would actually go further and say it's dangerous to try. I think healthcare at the moment is dangerous to try to do the complex elderly in 10 minutes. Uh, and I won't do it. I don't think I could do it anymore. Uh, so I'm now uh, not doing it. The right outcome... It's difficult, isn't it? It needs the right diagnosis, and we'll get that wrong about 15% of the time. So I train patients to always ask, what else could it be? How would I know? You know, diagnosis under pressure in 10 minutes, you're going to get it wrong, and that's the nature of diagnosis anyway. It won't always be what we think it is. So it's always a good question, what else will it be? Um, I've got a comedy T-shirt I wear that says on the front, if you tell me it's just a virus, I'll scream, <laughs> which is great to wear to the GPs. They love that. They think... Um, <laughs> But diagnosis is complicated. If you get the diagnosis wrong, then everything else that follows. And remember, over 50% of symptoms are probably medically unexplained. And it depends whether you're a clumper or a chunker. You could clump them all together in the umbrella of medically unexplained and go, well, that's just the way we live our lives. Uh, just go and change the way you wear your life. Or you can chunk them out into, I don't know, chronic fatigue syndrome or irritable bowel or all these other things. But a fair amount of them, I don't think uh, that medicalizing their lives actually helps them. Uh, I think most lives are living rather than medicalizing. The option is interesting is that now, in the old days, uh, we just decided for patients. There are dozens of options, including the one of not doing anything. 
And shared decision aids are great, but as Margaret says, they do take a long time to go through. But those options, again, if patients don't feel that they own the option that uh, they're going down, then they're not likely to adhere to it. The process is interesting. The NICE website is wonderful. If you look at the NICE website for patient experience, it's, I don't know what the, the guideline is, but it's amazing, patient experience. There are 14 things that all patients should have when they experience the NHS. It's like you've entered this wonderful fantasy uh, health service. I always argued, as well as NICE, we should have NIGE, which is the National Institute for Good Enough, because um, NICE sets a high bar up here, but we need the, the, the bar for minimal competence that we do on a bad day when we're feeling a bit knackered. We need to know what the low bar is as well as the high bar, and we're having a low bar day. We incrementally try to raise the bar little by little up to the nirvana of NICE at the top, and we haven't quite cracked that. The Care Quality Commission, it could be argued, is supposed to do that, but as Margaret pointed out, they're doing it in a fairly blunt, blamey, unpleasant way, which isn't making us happier. I strongly believe inspection is probably important, but it should improve the service in a constructive, collaborative way. It shouldn't fill people with fear and anger. Uh, and then trackers is another thing I do as a journalist, but also as a doctor. If care has gone off, it's either because it's not transparent, it's not right for you, it's not accessible, it's not accountable, it's not competent, it's not collaborative, not kind, effective, right first time, and safe. That, again, would be what NICE would want you to do all right first time. Uh, and that's quite an interesting way of analyzing stuff for me. Uh, I'm just going to end quickly by uh, talking about my family. That's me in Australia in 1967 or 8, I think. I've got something in my eye. I don't think I'm crying in my shorts. That's my dad and my mum, who was English, and my dad was an Australian. And dad was, as I say, a brilliant bloke, but suffered from depression. Uh, and sadly took his life in 1969 when I was seven and Steve, my brother, was nine. But what was interesting is this is his brother, Uncle Ron, okay? Uncle Ron is the happiest bloke I ever met. My dad used to suffer from periodic despair. Uh, he, dad might have been bipolar, actually, I'm not sure, but he clearly he had the despair. Uncle Ron was universally always happy, he lived to an age of 103, and never achieved anything in his life. <laughs> happiest bloke I ever met, <laughs> never achieved a thing. My strongest memory of Uncle Ron, he used to sit on the patio in West Leaderville in Perth in Western Australia, and rocking backwards and forwards, and, Every now and then, a little thought would come his way, a little challenge would come his way, and Uncle Ron would go, oh, fuck it. <laughs> fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. Now, I'm not saying fuck it is always the appropriate philosophy, but I would contest that if you work in any hierarchy, about 80% of the stuff that lands in your in-tray or inbox is nonsense, isn't it? It's bollocks. Let's be honest. You think, how will I benefit? How will patients benefit? Can I even understand this McKinsey wonk? It is bollocks. Uh, I used to be chair of governors of my local primary school. We had a couple of really good Ofsted inspections, but what I didn't tell the inspectors is that we used to make every Friday fuck it Friday. <laughs> and everyone would take the top 80% of their in-tray, we'd have a glass of white wine, we'd all get round the shredder and we'd go, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. <laughs> you have to create space in those wonderful brains of yours that don't really have the bandwidth for the 21st century. You've got to create the space for the stuff that matters, and that means clearing out all the clutter. So if there's one thing you take away with you this morning, I want you to promise me you will make every Friday <laughs> fuck it Friday. Can you do that? <laughs> or at least set up a trial to see if it improves things. <laughs> I've only done an N equals one trial, so I can't really say. Uh, finally, you only die once. This is the, the other point I want to make, is that um, uh, death, I think we're getting badly wrong. There are lots of people having inhuman deaths in hospital. We can't say how many people died uh, at mid staffs, we can say a lot of people had very unpleasant deaths. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, interesting story hospital chasing, chasing foundation status, following the targets, trying to get the money right, not having safe staffing levels, I think is probably the issue. Uh, this is my lovely stepdad. So my dad died, and my mum remarried a lovely bloke called Stan, who's a, a builder. Um, and Stan had heart surgery uh, 13 or 14 years ago, the week after I gave evidence at the Bristol Heart Inquiry. So I'd broken the story of the Bristol Heart Scandal in 1992. We had this huge public inquiry seven years later uh, that found that uh, perhaps three dozen babies had died unnecessarily and quite a few others were brain damaged. Uh, and I was called to give evidence because I'd broken the story in private eye and I gave evidence. I made lots of new friends at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. Uh, and then my lovely stepdad, Stan, had a triple vessel heart attack and needed urgent heart surgery in our local unit, which is Bristol. And I thought, well, this will be fun. So I went in with Stan onto the wards, and I had this list of questions. How many of these do you do? What sort of results do you get? How do you compare to the national average? Before I could even get my list out, the senior nurse spotted me and said to the professor of surgery, you know who that is, don't you? You better not fuck this one up. Uh, <laughs> 
Stan had a brilliant 13 years. He had wonderful heart surgery, Professor Angelini in Bristol, and Stan keeps himself in trim. He really has self-responsibility. He keeps himself in trim. He goes on walking holidays. He's just walked and walked and walked for 14 years and had a wonderful life. And then he came back from a walking holiday in September and suddenly turned yellow. Painless yellow jaundice in someone in 84 is not a great thing. And yes, he had a big mass at the head of his pancreas on a scan uh, that seemed to have spread to a few lymph nodes. Um, and they looked at or Stan actually looked at the evidence of having a Whipple's operation. They do them. Professor Neoptolemus in Liverpool probably does more of them than anyone else in people in their mid-80s, but once it's spread to the lymph nodes, not so good. Chemotherapy seemed fairly marginal, so he thought, actually, no, I'm not going to have any treatment for this. He had a lovely oncologist who said, well, actually, we'd still like to do a biopsy. And Stan said, well, I don't want treatment. Why do you want to do a biopsy? It's expensive. It's uncomfortable. And they said, we'd like to name the tumour. Uh, so Stan said, what about Dolores? Um, <laughs> Stan has been living with Dolores Golly for s over six months now. He had a fantastic Christmas. He actually stopped taking his statin, stopped taking all his heart stuff, ate as much pie and fat and sugar and cholesterol as he wanted. He put weight on for the first five months with pancreatic cancer. And he had wonderful, he saw all his friends. He's just had a wonderful time. This is an ancient barrel. Somebody's come up with a long barrow. A, a farmer in Wiltshire has reconstructed a, a, a long barrow. And Stan decided he'd quite like to have his urn stuck in there. So he went to visit and he's booked a shelf. And he's planned all that stuff. And he's just now is getting a bit weaker and starting to drift off and Dolores is getting the upper hand. But we've done all the stuff you need to do to have a decent, kind death at home. We've got really good GPs. The hospital service in Bath has been fantastic, really nice Macmillan nurses. We've done the hard work of getting the hospital bed in there, getting all the drugs ready for the syringe, having the do not resuscitate things stuck everywhere so if he falls over and the paramedics come, they don't cart him to hospital. All that stuff actually took quite a bit of effort and liaison. So although we want a death at home, and, and uh, Kate, Kate Granger will talk about this, she says it is a lot of effort doing it, and you need to plan it in advance. And you're not going to plan it in advance if you're not even talking about it. The three things that matter most in life often, well, money matters most, but after that, probably sexual health, mental health, and death. And they're three things that certainly British people don't talk about. So unless we're talking about it, how can we enact the evidence? Uh, and I don't, as I say, I don't know how Stan's stories will end, but I hope he has a peaceful death at home, and we've done everything we can to support that. Uh, and, and the amount of money that's spent at the end of life care on futile, futile treatment in hospital is quite staggering, and that's a huge area that we need to improve on. Okay, so finally, like, drop clangers for life and for a living, widen our circles of compassion and collaboration, reinstate, reclaim, and rekindle the NHS. Uh, it's public service values that need to come out again. Love yourself, I am enough. Um, I have the life of Riley. I am a media type, basically. I do lots of fun things. I do lots of great speeches. Isn't it lovely? Lots of smiley stories. Uh, but actually, these are the people I owe my uh, life to, really. These are the whistleblowers and patients who I've built a career on, I guess, in private eye. I've advocated for them. I've got their stories in the public domain. There's Steve Bolson, Raj Matu, lots of other people. Claire Bowen, whose daughter Bethany died of an avoidable surgical error. These are wonderful people. and the thing, These are my leaders because these people, terrible things happen to them, and yet... They stand up and they want a better NHS. They want to stop it happening to other people. So they get over their, well, they never get over it, but they live with their grief, but they want to stop this stuff happening to other people. Uh, and they're just wonderful people, and, and some of them have been really, really badly served by the system. And I think, golly, if we haven't got this right about being able to speak up without fear in the NHS, we haven't got anything right. That's my favourite. That's my sciencey bit. Uh, Jan Polonici, who's a, a statistician in... in London, came up with this lovely thing after the Bristol Heart Scandal. It was a paper in the BOMJ entitled Half of All Doctors Are Below Average uh, to point out that <laughs> you're never going to get the absolute best. And I think that's important, which is why I think we need NIGE, the National Institute for Good Enough. We need to know what the very best is, but we also need to know what the level is of service. We won't fall behind. And I'll tell you, patients are the best people to judge that. When you walk on a ward within about 10 paces, you can tell whether this is a safe environment or not. Most people can do that. We need to tap into that patient experience, that lived experience, to tell us uh, whether we're providing a service that's good enough, even if it isn't excellent. Uh, and finally, if you want to see the book, Staying Alive, How to Get the Best in the NHS, not enough reference in it, although it does quote Margaret's books and says how good they are. I thought, I can't be bothered to do a huge index of referencing because it'll take too long, but if I do plug Margaret's books, she might even forgive me. But half of it has been written by patients, and it's patient stories. It's not evidence-based in the sense it wasn't a random sample. <laughs> But actually, I think we can earn a huge amount from patient stories, uh, and they're the way to figure out how we get evidence into real life, and they're doing it. They're doing it in chat rooms, they're getting advice from charities, they're helping each other, and that's what we need to foster, because simply the NHS will fall to pieces unless we crack self-care. Self-care is the new frontier, and the best way to self-care is get the right evidence. So you, in Cochrane, the challenge to you, I guess, is to be getting this evidence into the chat rooms where people need it. 
Instead of just getting very angry when you look at something that's non nonsense in a chat room, how can you try to engage in it to try and correct it or at least start a negotiation to, to get it closer to the truth? So I think the answer probably is out there on the web somewhere. Um, don't leave the research up on a dusty shelf somewhere. Get it out on the front line, from the bottom up, my B-Day revolution. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, just before we break for lunch, I've got one last thing to do. We, we, we had a competition for medical students, which we did with Students for Best Evidence as well, to, to bring some students here for their first exposure to Cochrane. Maybe their first exposure to, to the speakers, too. And uh, I don't, I, we'll have to ask them afterwards what they thought about it. But, but Philip, if I could give that to you. To oh, yes. Uh, and if I could ask. The first prize winner was David Gregg. Oh, and, and David is from Sheffield. <laughs> I hope someone's taking a picture of this. <laughs> um, Uh, and and the, the, the second prize winner sadly couldn't be with us, but the third prize went to Emily Kidd from the University of Aberdeen. <laughs> yeah, 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 here we are. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, it's, t it's time for lunch, but just before we go, can I thank uh, Phil and Margaret? And again, it's been, it's been a fantastic uh, end to the morning. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.